Welcome to the Open to Hope show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my co-host and daughter. Dr. Heidi Horsley. This show is brought to you in partnership with the Compassionate Friends and the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation. Well, Heidi, we're going to talk about life after death today and about the fear of dying and that kind of thing with somebody who has written a book about it and knows a lot about it. It's going to be interesting, isn't it, Heidi? It is, Mom. And, and you know, Sandra's going to talk to us today about not only the fear of dying, but about how we find hope after we've had a loss. And I think the idea that there is life after death helps us to find hope, and it's very comforting. Absolutely. Will you want to introduce her? Sure, I'd love to. So we are going to interview our guest today, Sandra Champlain. And Sandra Champlain's fear of dying led her on a 15-year journey to find proof that life after death is real. After the death of her father, she created How to Survive Grief, a free audio that was quickly heard by thousands worldwide. Armed with this powerful information that has reduced pain and saved lives, she wrote, We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Welcome to the show, Sandra. Hello, ladies. Thanks for having me. I'm thrilled to be talking to you today. It's great to be on, and I noticed Bernie Siegel did your foreword. We know Bernie. <laughs> Bernie was my dad's doctor. 30 years prior to his death, he had had cancer and had gone into a spontaneous mm-hmm. remission while he was working with Bernie. And um, just a quick note, when it came time to write a book, I had a couple that was coaching me. You know, how do I take my words and put them in a book? And they said I needed a very powerful foreword. And I said, I don't know anybody that's famous <laughs> that would probably do it. And, and the man who was coaching me said, I keep getting this intuitive hit that you're supposed to call Bernie Siegel. And it was in like that moment that I got the flashback of him being my dad's doctor. And, of course, he didn't know me. But Bernie remembered my dad from 30 years before that. And it was just, so- I've had miracles upon miracles producing this book. So, yeah, it's good stuff. That's an amazing story. That really is. I mean, and that kind of fits in on what we're talking to about. I mean, the, I don't know if you want to talk about the veil between life and death and, you know, and people's fears. And now, now what made you, um, you know, go on this journey to figure out if there's life after death? What made you head there? It's very interesting. Yeah, it wasn't a loss per se, although I had lost pets and my grandfather had died, I don't know, 15 years before that. But I just started having this overwhelming fear, a fear of who am I, what's my life for, where do I belong. I'd look up at the stars and I'd think of the vastest universe and it, it all kind of came down on my shoulders as, you know, does Sandra live on after death? Is there more to this life? And I don't know the reason. I mean, I can look at the big picture now that I should have been on this journey so I could write this book and help others. But at the time, it was an overwhelming fear of dying. And so very secretly, I started exploring. Is is there any proof? Besides religion, I was raised Catholic and not knocking faith, but just having my religious faith wasn't enough to take away my fears. It's like somebody on this planet had to have some kind of proof. And so very secretly, I started exploring it because I was never somebody who believed in mystical things or the occult or spiritual stuff. You know, I'd hear mediums and all that, and I'd laugh. You know, anybody who saw astrologers, you know, they're crazy people. So this was a very secret journey. You know, my husband's a bit of a skeptic. I told him that you were going to be on the show today and what we were going to be talking about and showed him this book. And in fact, I even opened it up and I said, look, look at these wonderful comments. I was telling Heidi, it's so interesting that you've quoted famous people and what they've said about life after death and all that kind of thing. Yeah, so. we're normally skeptic. And I was a skeptic. And, you know, every one of us has this little negative voice inside of ourselves that is not our best friend when we look in the mirror every morning or when we hit the snooze button. I mean, there's a lot of negativity going on. And it's very hard for us to know something's real unless we can see it or hear it. You know, I, I always use the, the saying 150 years ago, if if we were to know that there's going to be something called radio, you know, and that this box and a car that didn't even exist would be able to be talking to us. Like, no way is that possible. And it's very hard for our minds to get around new things often. But you mentioned your husband in the book. I obviously had never written a book before, and I pictured a man sitting in front of me who did not believe in life after death, yet had a loss in his family that he was grieving. And so I'm in the book, and men and women can read it, but I'm talking to this man and saying, this is my journey. I'm not pushing anything on you, but this is what took me from skeptic to believer. And I've had just as many men, if not more, write to me, more men than women, about being a skeptic and how it changed their mind or opened their mind. Okay, so you're moving into it wondering, what was the first aha you got? 
the biggest aha that was so mind-blowing is I took a course in mediumship. Uh, the promise of the course was if you attend it, you're somebody who can accurately tell the deceased people around others. Now, prior to that, I'd been doing a lot of reading. I, I had some really kind of weird psychic hits, as you might call them, knowing people are calling me before they call, and then the phone rings and it's them, and knowing people's names before they introduce themselves. And so I secretly took this journey to California to study with a woman called Doreen Virtue. And in her course on mediumship, this is a, a fun story, but it'll give you goosebumps. The first thing she had us do is she says, I want to put your mind at ease and what mediumship is and what it isn't. We can all connect through the veil with our loved ones. So she had each one of us partner up with another person. She says, again, this is just make-believe. She says, I want you to use the power of your imagination, and I want you to pretend that a person is standing behind your partner. She says, you close your eyes, you will say a prayer beforehand, you imagine your heart's connecting with like an invisible energy field. And then she says, you know, you got to use be polite because there's still people and just introduce yourself quietly. Um, and, and while you're there, is there any messages that they want to give through me to my partner? So I have a great imagination. So because there was no fear of really playing medium and I could just create somebody, I decided to um, invent this guy. And I said to her, I see behind you a man. I'm thinking it's your grandfather on your mother's side. His name was Jan. Uh, in my mind, I'm seeing a fish, fishing boat. So I'm like, well, he was a fisherman in Denmark. That kind of came out of my mouth. I said, he's got blonde hair, blue eyes big gap between his front teeth. I said he died of lung cancer. Um, and there's always this profound message, or not always, but very often, uh, that you're to give. And so what came to my mind is um, this guy, your grandfather, wants you to tell your mother that he loves her. While he was on planet Earth, he was kind of a tough dad and never spoke the words, I love you. So anyways, I opened my eyes to saying, okay, it's your turn to go. And there's just streams of tears coming down this woman's face. Mm. Her grandfather's name was Jan on oh the other side. He, yeah, I got the goosebumps too because it, it's so hard to like get that this really has happened to me. Um, but he was from Denmark. He was a fisherman. He fit the description. He died of lung cancer. And no he never did tell his own daughter that he loved her. And so mm. from the skeptic, that was the first thing that was just like, holy cow, th there is something to this. Wow. There's definitely something. Yeah. So then I just kept digging, 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 digging. What else can I find? I just, uh, we had an experience a couple of months ago on our compassionate friends. We have a meeting for brief parents and there was a woman there who said, I didn't believe in any kind of afterlife stuff. Her husband just died. She's had a really rough time. Her daughter died. So she said, I went to the Compassionate Friends National Conference last year and I sat next to this woman and, and I was a total skeptic about anything. And I had said before I went, you know, if there's anything going on in this afterlife, give me a sign. She said, I never thought I'd get a sign. Yeah. She said, I turned to the woman next to me and I said, well, tell me about your child's death. It turned out this is the same name as her daughter. She was studying to be a veterinarian and they were born on the you same day. I, oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I was a skeptic until, until after Scott died and I started hearing the hundreds and hundreds of stories like this. And then it's kind of hard to be a skeptic because you know what you like, no matter what people's religious beliefs are, socioeconomic, you know, ethnicity, whatever, there's all these common threads and themes that run through stories about loss. One of the things I really like in your book is you've got homework assignments. I mean, this book is, you know, uh, people yes. really want to go into it. I mean, they don't have to take your word for it, do they? They can look at your journey and, hey, and you're telling them what they can yeah. do. Yep, you know, one of the DJs that interviewed me in, actually it was in Connecticut after the Sandy Hook uh, massacre, um, I went on a local radio show, and um, one of the things he said is, uh, my book, We Don't Die, is more than just a, why there's life after death and helping people through grief. It's actually a handbook for being human. Because uh -huh. the thing is, is, if we don't die, and our loved ones are around us, well then what the heck is this life? And so the exercises inside we don't die are for people to um, get in touch with who they are what their dreams are what their life's about you know there's something that happens when most people die is they look back on this life and 
there's regrets, you know, there's fears of the unknowns, there's what I should say, what I shouldn't have said. People are reaching towards faith, even if they've never had it before. And what would it be like to have everything handled uh, so that when we close our eyes for the very last time here on planet Earth, like we know, we really look back on our life like it made a difference. And so that's what people get up doing the exercise. Okay, give me one of your favorite exercises. My favorite exercise, I think, is and this is a morning exercise, is to have a, a notepad that you keep by your bed, and you do two things in the morning. One is you say what you're grateful for. And there's a thing about it's so easy to see what we haven't done or what we need to do or where we're not good enough, but on the gratitude list, it's like you really think about what you're grateful for in life. And it can really be some of the basics. I mean, there's some homeless people out there. It's winter time now when we're recording this. And, you know, we're inside a warm, cozy house. We'll make a list of, of some things you're grateful for. And then the second thing is, is if you were to talk to anybody in your life and you were to ask them, you know, what are the five best things about me? Or, or what would you say about me? Or you don't even have to say the best things. But if you were to describe me to somebody, you know, what? What would you say? And when you can either literally talk to people and ask them this question, or you can really think about it, what would people say? And so for me, for example, who's, you know, I've got the unlovable, still single at the age of 48, you know, not good enough, not pretty enough. Well, when I think about what people would say, I'm loving, I'm generous, I make a difference, I'm passionate, I'm funny, I'm inspiring, you know, and, and more of those words start coming out. It's, it's like it puts that little voice of negativity in the back seat if we were driving a car. And it can start our day being super duper duper empowered to go after our dreams um, and our goals and to make things happen. So tell people how they can get your book. Uh, my book is available wherever you buy books. We don't die a skeptic's discovery of life after death is the title just to share with you and your listeners i started my own podcast my own radio show where i interview people why they believe in life after death so don't just take my word for for it with my book but listening to these stories and i'm sharing this website because it's also the way to get in touch with great me. we don't die radio.com we don't die radio.com spell it as all one word and on there if you join what i call as my insiders club i actually have a preview copy of my book that you can you can read like the pdf style you can get a free copy of that how to survive grief audio that's made such a difference and a whole bunch of other stuff i i'm a firm believer in giving it all and, and making a difference wherever i can and in turn, a ton of people buy my book, so I'm not worried about the sales. I'd rather make a difference in someone's wow. life. So uh, we don't die radio.com. Great. And I'm looking at your book right now, and all of a sudden I felt like I was walking down that bridge into that light, my girl. Wow. That was powerful. Wow. Sandra, I just wanted to ask you something, because uh, in the book you talked about race car driving and cooking. W what's your day job? Oh, it's a funny thing because people would never expect this, but my mom and I started a catering business almost 30 years ago that we cook for race car teams. We travel from Florida, from Daytona, California, Toronto, um, all over the place cooking for minimum 500 people per meal, maximum 1,500 people per meal. So um, we feed them and my teams win the races and uh, it, it's interesting. It's um uh, you know, so it is funny, though, because no matter what I'm doing, you know, I can still have more passions like sharing my book. You know, and that's interesting because there's a little downtime in there, right, in the tent that you can talk to people about some of these issues? Yeah, there is. Um, you, I never know who I'm talking to ever. I mean, I've sat next to people on an airplane who ask, what do you do for a living? And, oh, gosh, so many times I'm afraid to say, oh, I'm an author of a book called We Don't Die. You know, the fear is always there. But then when I share, I find out that maybe they've lost a loved one. So under my tent, you know, there's people that have been diagnosed with cancer. There's people that have lost a loved one. And I have one quick story that is another one that will give you goosebumps. One of the race car drivers who is now an ESPN television announcer, he saw – my book table because I'm at the racetrack. I've got the buffet, but then there's also a table where I'm selling my books. I love a banner that. that says we don't. Die. And he came up to me and he says, "Sandra, what's this book all about?" And so I told him my story, 
And he said to me, can I share something with you that I've never told anyone? And I'm like, absolutely. He said, when I was in my 20s, he said, I got into a terrible car accident. And he said, I actually flatlined on the operating table. He said, I rose above my body, like you hear about. He said, my grandmother and grandfather were there. He says, it was a world more real than what we have now. And he said, I knew I had died, but he said, I was floating over my body and I could see my mom and my dad and my brother praying for me. So he said, I knew I had the choice whether to go with grandma and grandpa or come back to earth. And he said, I chose to come back to earth. And he said, when he woke up in his body, he was obviously in a lot of pain. But where this man went from his 20s into he's now in his, in his um, late 50s, he won a ton of championships in all different kinds of series of racing. And he said, Sandra, because I wasn't afraid of dying, I wasn't afraid of living. So he says, I took more chances. I, and he said, I, I was more aggressive on the race car, in the race car. And so it's interesting because here's a man who's never told this story because he was afraid of what people would think. And so he confided it in me. And I thought to myself, if people can read my book, We Don't Die, and can learn to not be afraid of dying, so not be afraid of living. Now, I don't mean go 200 miles an hour in a race car, but to take risks, to say things to someone, like you may be afraid to say I love you, you might be afraid to go after that new job, you may be afraid to whatever it is, and to know that there's ultimately nothing to be afraid of, and to play a little bit more full out in life. So I love that, and that came out of just a conversation at the racetrack. Well, thank you so much for being on the show again, and I also know that you do speaking and engagements, and uh, you go to conferences and that kind of thing, and so if people want that, they can get uh, in touch with you through your website, right? Or you can spell sandrachamplain.com. Uh, okay. And get to me there. It takes, it takes you to the same place, either website. All right. Fantastic. And thank you so much for being on the show and for all your good works. You're welcome. Ditto. Back at you. Thanks, thanks, Sandra. Thank you for all your positive message of hope for everybody out there that's lost their So thank you for that. Well, Heidi, you know, and you and I know, particularly with bereaved parents or whatever, they do need some reassurance that there are things there, but also that there are some things that they can do to raise their vibration. I, I really like those ideas that Sandra had. I love that. And like Sandra said, we can get really down on ourselves, especially when we've had a major loss in our lives. I like the idea of doing a quick gratitude. Okay, what are things out there that we're still grateful for, even though we've had this loss? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's pretty powerful because it does shift your energy. Right. Well, thanks for listening to our show today. And we hope that you will work on your vibration and, and some energy shift and hope that you can fill some of ours today. And we want to, Heidi and I want to remind you that if you've lost hope, we offer to have you lean on ours until you find your own. And God bless. <laughs>